Welcome. It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson. I'm so glad you came. We have another guest that I know you will want to meet, and his name is Matthew Condon. And Matt is the CEO of Athletic and Rehabilitation Center, and he's one of our neighbors here in oh. Overland Park. <laughs> and he, you do an awful lot of things for one guy, <laughs> Matt, I, I do have to say. But I, the reason that um, I invited Matt is that the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce every year picks a small business of the year, and they get the Mr. K Award, uh, named for Mr. Kaufman, and the uh, Athletic and Rehabilitation Center got that award. And I need to tell you that there were 1,400 applicants, and there were 119 um, businesses that were considered as finalists, and there were 10 winners, and then there was just one winner of the Mr. K Award. Mm. So, way to go, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, you started this business about seven years ago. Yeah, 2003. Mm -hmm. And you were getting an MBA and a law degree. So if I have any legal problems, <laughs> we can talk about that too. And a law degree. And during that time, you put together a business plan. I did. Let's talk about a business plan. Great. What, what I, I am always foggy on a business plan. What, what did you do? What is, a, what is a business plan and what was yours? Uh, well, the business plan was re really two parts. One was kind of um, encapsulating what, what the mission of the company was, what we were going to try to do. Which was? W was to provide health care services in, in kind of a un new and unique way. And um, so to, to, to encapsulate that within a business plan was important not only for me to kind of plan out our future, but for the investors that I brought in. I wanted them to see what we were trying to accomplish and how it was going to be different than, than what was out there in the marketplace. And then the other one was frankly uh, um, on a financial side to start putting together a financial model of expectations. You know, you don't, you can't, look, it's not a crystal ball to look into the future, but it is um, an honest depiction of um, the financial resources needed. Um, how, how do you know that? How can you make a projection <coughs> of financial resources needed? I don't know. It's a guess. I mean, it, to be quite honest yeah. with you, it's not. But uh, I had experience when I was um, doing my MBA and uh -huh. my law degree. I consulted with a firm out of Chicago. I see. And so I was familiar um, with the basic um, things that were needed to get it started. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest of it is, it is a leap of faith. It's a leap of faith for the person that for does it. For you too. Yeah, it is, you for thought, sure. You now, how do I get on welfare? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, frankly, yeah. that was one of the things that um, we talked about through this, this um, small business. Mm -hmm. um, it, you get out of law school, you have law school debt, and you have grad school debt. And, uh, but I was fortunate to have not only um, a family that supported entrepreneurialism, but a wife that was um, very supportive and, and, and truly a partner. And she got behind this and said, it's okay to not take a job over here that is maybe uh, a more sure source of income and, and kind of she follow She could have said that, Matt. She could have. And it would have kept you from... It would have. Yeah, yeah, it would have. Because that, that's the most important thing to me. Even more important in this business is, is that relationship. And she was always so supportive of this mission and everything. And so, and, and I, when I won the award, or when we won the award um, last month, um, she was certainly one of the first people that I, I thank because she was a part of this deal. And so you should. Yeah, and so I should. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are a couple things I want to pull out of sure. just what you said. You said a new and unique way. Yes. Why is that important? Uh, well, I, I don't think it's a secret anymore. We, really, we, we frankly felt it in 2003 that um, the medical model was broken, that the path that we were on in 2003 and the way in which health care services were being provided, kind of this, um, you know, churning out and volume churning based. Is a good and word, it yeah. is, yeah. And not really focused on quality. There was a lot of talk about transparency, but not a real talk about quality at that time. And we recognized that early. And um, so we created a model in which um, we don't see as many patients and we are able to track outcomes that really prove value. Because value often isn't see that person a lot and see them for less. Sometimes it's see them less often, but provide really quality care in the few moments that that person has the to, to, to give to the healthcare provider. I mean, and that's all well and good, but you have to is. make a living. You have to make a living. So, you're depending on quality and volume. Yes, to some extent, really, yeah. you're, you're depending on quality, and then you're depending on contracting um, with people and making sure that they understand your value proposition as well. 
the group health providers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, United, um, we do a lot of workers' compensation care. So those workers' compensation care um, insurance companies, we had to make the case to them that we were better than everybody else. Okay, let's go back because there's an important <laughs> point here, you see. You're not seeing individuals one at a time for the most part. You're contracting with companies. That's true, yes. So um, your, your volume is built into the contract and you don't see those people every day and maybe some of you never see at all. Well, what's important though, um, and just to clarify, we, what we do is, especially with the companies, Kansas and Missouri are two of 11 states right now that are employer directed. So if you work for, if I work for you and I get hurt, uh -huh. you're going to pay for it and you get to tell me where to go. We have this value discussion with the employer and say why we're greater value, why one-on-one -on -one care is so important, why mm -hmm. quality is more important over, um, you know, some of the other things that drive health care. But, but there's no responsibility for you to send me anyone. Uh, so I don't get paid for anything. And I think that's an important point. It's very make. important. It's important. So therefore, it is incumbent upon you yes. to have quality. Otherwise, I'm not going. Every day. Yeah. Each and every day. And that is, and, and, it, and, and not just quality. I think the other thing that probably a lot of um, the users of the healthcare industry are aware that we lost some is there's quality in, in providing care, and there's also customer service. We have this rule where our customers don't wait in our waiting room for two minutes over their, their appointment time. They need to get in. Their time is valuable also. Well, that's they right. And, and, and they need seen. to feel that you feel that their time is Absolutely. valuable. Absolutely. And we do. Perception and, and we do. is very important. It perception is. Perception of your company, perception of the people that they see. When the first person they walk in, I always think, is often the person that l l makes the lasting impression about that company. It's, it's frankly, it's, it's funny you mention that because I just hired one um, earlier today. We pay our front desk people more than our competitors. And I'm okay with that. And I make no apologies about that. And I tell our front desk people, mm -hmm. we expect more from you than everybody else. And we expect you to be great at what you do. And they are. Our, our, our front desk people are, are outstanding. But the way in which they communicate with the patients and show the patients they really care about them is, is a critical part of our business model. It is. There's another thread I want to pull out of sure. something you said. And that word is investors. Mm -hmm. How do you, where do you look for them? How do you know how much to ask them for? How many is, my, my husband always said he never liked partners. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they want to yeah. put their finger in your sure. business. So how do you handle that? And what did you do? I, uh, uh, my story is, is really one that I've been so fortunate to be, happen to be in, in the right place at the right time and meet the right people. Um, I ran into um, who, my first initial investor, mm -hmm. also now has become my business partner. He's become a part of the, the company, and uh, and his name is Kevin O'Rourke. He's our CFO. He was actually um, one I, that I, same time. I yeah. saw his name. In and he's a wonderful man. Believed in the mission, and uh, brought the other investors to the table. The few that the other few that we did, but um, you know, I, I I couldn't agree with your husband more. That's a critical decision. Um, when I became partners with Kevin O'Rourke, I probably didn't know all the hurdles that, that w are there in the normal um, you know, partnership relationship. But I can tell you um, our story is still, uh, we have a great friendship and a great partnership. We work really well together. He's good at a lot of things that I'm not good at. Fine, and fine. Keeping track of the finances is probably. Is great. Yeah. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that at home or at work. Well, see. And he's great at it's it. A, it's a real important it's, job. It's critically important. And he yeah. doesn't, um, you know, we kind of let each other do what we're good at and, and then and use each other as resources for the things that we're not so good at. I, and, and that way I've just, frankly, been lucky. How many investors did you think you wanted or needed or how many did you end up with? You know, it's, it's funny. So, um, you know, when you, you put a business model together and uh -huh. you're using your credit card to pay your rent, yeah. asking for $10,000 seems like a lot of money. Yes, <laughs> so yes, yes. Um, we didn't, I didn't really go out there um, with the idea that I wanted a certain number. Mm -hmm. I went out there with a recognition I needed a, cer I cer needed a certain amount of money to uh -huh. get started. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so really went to Kevin and he, um, he right away was very interested in both the mission and the model. Uh -huh. And then he brought in a few, frankly, friends um, to, to round that out. But, he but they're took not the there on a daily basis. They're never there. Yeah, no, yeah. they're never there. And it's been a great investment for them. And I, I'm so thankful for they were the seed money at the very beginning. And now, um, you know, they get to reap the benefits. And good for them because they've earned that right. I think that, yeah. I think yeah. that. Now, when you won this prize, it wasn't just because you were a nice guy. No. <laughs> so they, uh, you had uh, on-site reviews of the business. We did. And you had um, uh, visitors 
we did. What were they looking for? What did they, when you had an on-site review, what were the points that they were particularly interested in? And I think that the people who are watching, there are many people out there that because of the economy particularly have started their own businesses. Yes. And I think it's important to be able to pick out just the high points of what they wanted to know when they reviewed your business, what they wanted to see when they came to your site. You know, um, it's a great question. I actually asked that after we won. I asked Chris Lester, you know, what is what did I do? Why right? did we win? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, and it's interesting looking back on it in retrospect. They're not real forthcoming with that, and I think that's really great because they ask you to be yourself, really make an honest uh, showing of who you are. But it's clear that they are concerned about, um, or they valued employee relationships a lot, how you how you work with your associates. They they really they really looked at the things that Mr. K did for his companies and try to emulate those qualities or try to take those qualities and then judge the top 10 against them. And it was employee relationships. It was charitable giving for sure. Um, it was growth. It was business growth and, and being kind of an innovator within your own industry, whatever efficiency. that may be. Efficiency. Efficiency. It was efficiency for sure. Um, and, it was, uh, and it was culture. I think really what they look for is a culture um, within the company that supported not only people working really hard and driving toward a mission but one that they supported each other also. And, um, you know, a as with, with everybody, we are fortunate to be a company about our people. And we, um, if there's one thing that I would actually pat myself on the back for, because most of our, our success is not related to me, um, I hired well. And we have unbelievable people. Oh, but people. Matt, that's the key. Well, <laughs> it, it, it isn't ours. Yeah, it We're is We're washed ours. up if you yeah. haven't done that. But yeah. we have remarkable people. Yeah. And that's why um, we've had the success that we've had. It's why we've had the growth that we've had. And I think it's why we won this award is for the people that work at ARC. Well, and I think that even though I would suggest to you that <laughs> even though these people are not stockholders in the company, you have, in essence, sold them stock in the company Absolutely. because they have an, a, a, an ownership. Absolutely. You have allowed them to have a personal ownership in the company and have rewarded them for the, the good things that the company does. Absolutely. And we talk a lot about that mission to be a catalyst to change. I think the, the people that come to work for ARC, they want to do more than punch a clock. They want to be a catalyst to change in healthcare. And they want to change the way um, that healthcare is provided, not only in the way we provide it, mm -hmm. but now through our growth, we're getting competitors that copy what we're doing. And that's OK. That's a win for us. The greatest us. form of flattery. It is. And, and, and you know what? They're providing better care, and they're raising the standards. Yeah. And that's we're absolutely comfortable with that. The other thing that I'll bet you that they looked at when they came to the site was whether or not it was clean. Oh, sure. I'll bet they did. Oh, sure. And uh, they looked in the corners, and they looked at the, at the uh, employees, and they looked, at, they looked at everything. Sure. Because the, the presence of the company is really important. The, the, oh, I don't know, the, you know, the, the, the atmosphere energy, yeah. and the energy that comes out of that com company. I'm it's, sure they look at Especially that. in healthcare. I mean, we yeah. talk about that when we build our clinics out. Uh, the atmosphere is important. We want there to be bright lights and nice colors and it to be welcoming and, and warm. And um, we want it to be an atmosphere that not only supports physical health, but psychological health as well. That's an Had you part. started that company when you started to look for investors, or did you have nothing but a business plan? Had a business plan. Had a business plan. Was you know was was finishing law school. Was going to go work for a law firm. Frankly, um, mm -hmm. I was I was either going to go work for the company that I worked with out of Chicago, um, and they had been they are to this day a tremendously successful company. Mm -hmm. um, they were three single guys, mm -hmm. and I was married, and so that wasn't necessarily a great cultural fit. But it was a great company, and so I had created this business plan based on what I thought they did well and what I thought maybe could be done better. Ran into Kevin and really planned at that time to not go work with them, to work at a law firm here in Kansas City for a few years and save up my own money, and then start the business at that time. And Kevin, being the visionary guy that he is, said, oh, let's just do it now. I'll invest in it. If you run it, let's go. Let's see if we can make this so happen. So you didn't have to convince anybody that you were a winner. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, no, I, I, again, I, it's, it's almost a remarkable story because the people jumped on it so quickly. I really didn't go out and search out um, But you do people. now but I do now. You have to convince people that you're a winner. How do you oh. do that? When you go, if hmm. you're coming to see me and you want me to sign my business to sign a contract with you, I have a thousand employees. That's yeah. a good size contract. Absolutely. So I, I, you know, you're a nice guy, but absolutely, you yeah. know, what? It needs to be more than me just being a nice guy. That's <laughs> for right. Sure. That's and, right. And I think the, what has fostered a lot of our growth 
are the facts um, moving forward. We've gone from seeing a few hundred visits in 2003 to 65,000 in 2009. And we've done that being a little different player in the marketplace. We've done that based on our value proposition. And we have companies now from all over the region and the country visiting with us about how to make, how to provide them services and hopefully get the same types of benefits that their competitors maybe have in our marketplace. Well, it occurs to me that performance and word of mouth is really what you've done. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and you know, it's important for me that we continue to do that way. Listen, our, our deals are never a, a contractual relationship where people send me everybody. We have to earn our business tomorrow, just like we did today. Well, and you, you do a variety of things. I mean, I say the Athletic and Rehabilitation Center, but that sort of limits what you do by title, and that's not exactly true. So you do employment testing? We do. What is that? Um, we help companies determine what the essential functions of the job are from a physical standpoint. From a physical standpoint. And okay. then we help them determine if the people can or can't do them. And if they can't, then there's a whole other um, dialogue that goes on about if they have a disability and is there a reasonable accommodation. But really what we help them do is put people in the right jobs for them um, from a physical standpoint. Well, and you have to keep in mind the federal regulations Absolutely. on disability. And so ADA. you have to know a lot. Being a lawyer doesn't hurt. That helps. And that's yeah. really my specialization. I, I spend most of my time with ADA and FMLA and those, yeah. those areas of law. Yeah. Yeah. I'm helping companies with that. Okay. And you do physical and occupational therapy. We do. And um, you could get me moving faster, could you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we can. Yes. I know that. Um, I told you I have a friend who's one of your clients and speaks very highly. Her daughter was injured. Appreciate basketball that. player. Yeah. And uh, you got her back on her feet and she stayed with you with a trainer, so yeah. you, you keep her not only uh, in good physical shape after the broken ankle, but now. Yeah, and you know, that, that's an important part of the, the entire model, that sports medicine model. Mm -hmm. um, we take that, we take all the research, the billions of dollars that are spent within sports to get athletes back out on the court, and we try to apply it to the firefighters and police officers of this community, or other people, um, because they deserve that high quality of care as well. And really, um, those people make this country work you know well, and so, lugging around those hoses is yeah. not easy it's yes. tremendously important yeah. and so that's a really we it's they seem like two diverse populations to see but they're really not there's a synergy there and it comes down to quality and, and each um, moment they have with that person maximizing it to try to enhance performance as much well, as possible but, but we all have performance challenges sure. in whatever we do and they're basically the same if you do any kind of movement Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the movement, the type varies, but the wear and tear on your body is basically the same. It's function. Yeah. It all comes down to function and enhancing function in whatever we can. And, and, and the needs are different for each individual, but it doesn't change that they deserve really good care. The third thing that you do is wellness programs. Yes. Now, wellness is a major big issue now because the so. care of medical, I mean, the cost of medical care is... Whoop, Yes. Out the window. So how do, you, how do you do the wellness program for a company? Do you assess the, look at the employees and say, well, you got 10 fat ones and 10 too fat <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Um, you know, th that's been a, a large part of our recent growth mm -hmm. has come in wellness with reform is a major part of it. And I think um, reform was set up to incentivize industry to, to put wellness programs in place for their insureds. And so... Um, wellness, there's this, this movement, which we've been hopefully a major part of, to redefine wellness and make it um, to, to include the things that's been before. We need to get people to stop smoking and stop drinking too much and to start exercising and some. Get up off the couch. But, but doing something. Yeah. It's not just stopping. It's doing something also. Because if we're going to have any real meaningful impact on the cost of health care, we have to do more than stop smoking and stop drinking too much. We have to start doing things. And where are we going? Matt, with health care. I mean, we are all in a quandary here, no matter how old or how young, how sick or how well, yeah. we are in a quandary about health care. We are. We maintain a level of optimism, though. I mean, and I really believe this. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I, I make a lot of trips to Washington, D.C. now mm -hmm. to visit about it. And I think um, we're having real discussions now, and people are being honest. Instead of just saying, a lot of the health care reform discussion was about who's going to pay for these rising costs. We're going to shift it from this group to this group or whatever. Now but, what I've seen... But you're just shifting the same shifting. dime from Peter to Paul. We are, absolutely. Yeah. And now you're seeing a lot more real conversations, not only in Washington, D.C., but here in Kansas City and at people's kitchen tables about, well, 
this isn't going to solve our problem. We what still will? have a problem. What will, Matt? Or what will make it? I'm not sure that a move will solve the problem, but yeah. what should we be doing? We have to be, wellness, and, wellness has to become something that we all take, whether it's coming from our employer, whether it's coming from within us. But we're going to have to start doing things. We're going to have to start exercising. We're going to have to start looking at our diet in new ways. More information coming out about what proper diets are. And um, we're going to have to stop doing all the things that we're doing that are bad, but we have to start acting and doing things. And that's going to, I really believe that a lot of this healthcare reform, the good things, and there are some good things that are happening within this healthcare reform. They're going to empower uh, employers to um, incentivize healthy lifestyles in, in really new and unique ways that I think are going to have a meaningful impact. But see, let's go back again and pull out that word, <laughs> incentivize. Yes. You can my mother always said you can catch more flies with honey than yeah, you can absolutely. with vinegar. So what incentive are you going to offer me to get my sad old bones up off the couch and move them? Well, um, so it's two parts because yeah. we have to incentivize the employer to put it in. Yeah. And I think the, the government did that with this health care reform. They moved from a 20 to 30 percent tax um, credit for comprehensive wellness plan and they opened it up for 50 percent. And if I'm providing family benefits for an employee, that can run $14,000. So a $7,000 tax credit is a significant financial incentive for me as an employer to put mm -hmm. it in place. Mm -hmm. um, secondarily to that, what you're seeing is what, we, what we're hopeful for is that as the federal government defines what comprehensive wellness plans are, they're going to be um, exercise. It's going to be a major component of it. It's going to be mental health also. It's going to be physical health. I think actually financial health and he having employers articulate to their employees, you know, what financial health looks like. Mm -hmm. but, but physical health is going to start being less about stopping things and more about exercise. Well, you know, Matt, any good mechanic will tell you <laughs> that it is much cheaper to do preventive maintenance than it is to fix the car. No question. And we forget that. No question. And not we to, do. I, I, I've said this before, I, I loathe the fact that statistics are shotgunned around this conversation, but the CDC reports that if we get rid of smoking, obesity, and um, lack of exercise, we get rid of 40% of, uh, of cancers, 80% of cardiovascular disease, and 80% of type 2 diabetes which represents $560 billion a year of our health care costs. I mean, those three things alone, if we could just get obesity, smoking, and uh, exercise to be a, a fundamental part of our daily lives, we have saved our children trillions of dollars. And that's, well, that's the focus. And the sad truth is that our children are getting more sedentary and yes. fatter. Yes, they are. And, and, and so if I could put a little plug in, um, that's part of the reason why, and I think it's part of the reason why maybe we won the award, we started a youth obesity program um, with the schools for that very reason, because for us to continue to see just the greatest athletes in town and for us to work with the people once they are, you know, employable, 18 years old or older, uh, we recognize that we weren't really, we weren't having as big an impact on the community as we wanted. And to have as big an impact on the community as we want, we have to get to those schools. And those schools have, a, have an issue. And some of it has to do with lack of funding. Some of it has to do with lack of direction. But Some of it has to do with technology. Some of it has to do with technology. Because these kids, and adults as well, sit with their head in the computer. Absolutely. And they're behind on the chair, and they don't move. Uh, video games have had an yeah. incredible impact on our youth. Um, we the didn't one, have video the games. one good thing <laughs> I read about video games is, that, you know, these kids have yeah. happy thumbs and, yeah. and forefingers. They have good eye-hand coordination. That's right. <laughs> they can't run a quarter mile, but I they can they have good eye-hand That's hand. right. I Absolutely. can't do this, but, yeah. you know. But yeah. And but we're seeing that. And, yeah. and you see that. And then you create a, a big separation between the athletic kids and the non athletic kids. Um, that's something we really want to address. Through our sports performance program, we see some of the greatest athletes, frankly, in the world, um, certainly in this community. Uh, but we weren't seeing those kids that maybe didn't want to kick a football or, or shoot a basketball. And we want to impact them as well. Absolutely. And so that's part of the program. Uh, now, you do proactive consulting. Is that what we we're do. talking about here? What is proactive? Well, um, you, you know, so I think one of the reasons why we grew within the workers, or within the industrial segment so much is we recognized um, for us to continue to see employees injured in the workplace mm -hmm. um, was maybe good for our checkbook, but not good for our philosophy. And so um, we, we go out to those companies and we say, okay, we've been seeing a lot of injuries from this segment of your population. Let's figure, let's try to determine if it's an ergonomic issue, if there's something going on with the workplace that we can adjust. It might be as simple as getting, when you say an ergonomic issue, it might be as simple as getting a different kind of chair. A stool. There are times when a $5 stool will save that company $50,000 in rotator cuffs. 
a year. Mm -hmm. And that's what um, that's what's really meaningful about my position is to be able to go out and then when they have injured employees, we, we will see them. But um, when there are instances where we can avoid all the things that happen with an injury, and it's not just financial, you know, it's personal to that per, you know, to that individual. When we can help them, it means to their livelihood. Often, it means it their really livelihood. Does. It means their their time with their children. Mm -hmm. When we can help mitigate their exposure to the, those kind of hardships, that's a really neat thing. It occurs to me that you learn something when you see these injured employees. Absolutely. Because often it's just a little something that can be fixed, and some of these injuries are really, but particularly if they work around machinery. Absolutely. You know, it, and, it, and, and that's what's nice about our position. We had an issue with uh, Missouri Department of Transportation. They were, um, they were buying bags that weighed, I think, 90 pounds. Um, because bags the of what? bags of cement. Oh, uh huh. Uh, ninety uh -huh. pounds because uh -huh. they were because a ninety pound bag was significantly less than buying two forty five pound bags. But when we were able to identify the injuries that were happening from that and ninety pound bag and what those injuries cost them and what they cost yeah, and yeah. associate it back to what the forty five pound bag cost, um, they're able to see they significant. Say, Give savings. me those forty five pound bags. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's really meaningful yeah. because now they're seeing it in a financial way, but their but their individuals are seeing it in a physical way that are, that is a win-win for everybody. Yeah. What is one of the most interesting companies that you have ever consulted with to do this proactive consulting that you were able to fix? What well, comes to mind? Well, I, I have to say the work that we uh, work with our, our post-op employment testing technology, in particular through MoDOT, um, was really meaningful because they put a lot of resources around re-engineering the work site. Um, they, they did a lot of things with their vehicles that were really meaningful to save, and, and they seem to with their Re what did they do with their vehicle? They um, created. Uh, they had an issue with um, lifting the tires actually from the roadway, and so they re-engineered the back of the truck so they had kind of a, a winch system that would aid the employee in, in lifting the tires out. And 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 as a result, frankly, um, their results have been the most profound of the companies we work with. I think in um, you know, and, and I'm not absolutely sure about these numbers, but in three or four years, they saved close to ten million dollars in, in real savings of lost injury days. Um, Productivity and absenteeism, work comp costs, group health costs. So putting money on one end saves you perhaps three, four, five, or six times as much on the other end. It works. It's difficult for people to do in these economic times to shift money forward. It is. But um, it works, and it works in a and and so now we're starting to have the facts to support that. We knew it worked before, but we couldn't really identify it through a return on investment analysis, now we can, mm. and it works. You know, I know that you're interested in health care, not, not only in prevention, but in health care as a, um, a, you know, curing type thing. Absolutely. Um, I, I, where do you think, I noticed in the paper the other day that Senator Robertson, <coughs> he's not alone. Right. He wants to repeal and redo these health care reforms that have been passed. I, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, yeah. but starting all over from scratch, I don't know where is health care going? I don't have the answer. I, yeah. I'm not trying to <laughs> force you into no. a corner here. I just don't know. I think there's going to be another discussion. I think what we had was a health insurance reform. You know, we ha how we pay for it, as you and I just discussed, we reformed that. Whether we made it better or worse, that's a whole different, but we did change the way in which we pay, paid for it. We didn't change the way in which healthcare services are provided or the way in which individuals um, understand our own health. And so I think that's, that's the conversation I'm quite frankly more interested with. And I've visited with Senator Roberts, who's been great. Um, he's a wonderful guy. He, he, and he's, he's been great on you know, some other healthcare, the rural healthcare initiative and some other things that he's been really proactive about. But um, So what you're saying is that we have been sort of mesmerized with the cost. Yeah, we didn't really address with it. The, well, that's right, and, and not with the with the uh, product, the uh, yeah. the evolution of the product from office Absolutely. call to. So that's where we need to go. And that, and that I think is going to happen. That's part of my optimism. Yeah. I think that's going to happen. Where's your business going in the near future? We've we have been uh, fortunate to experience a lot of growth. We're careful about our growth moving forward because our growth has been based um, first and foremost on quality of care. And as you grow from a staff of three employees to eighty. Um, the concern is that you can't and more keep than that one site quality. too. Yeah, now more we have um, really eleven sites around yeah. the community: nine outpatient clinics, and then we have clinics in two businesses: Goodyear and American Eagle. Do you um, do you anticipate changing your focus? No, no. We'll we'll, we'll grow. Well, we'll I have to tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that it wasn't Mr. Kaufman who said it, but it was um, it was uh, Hallmark uh, Joyce Hall. He said, "Do what you do well and do more of it." Yeah, that's what that's what we, we're going to do, that's and we're going to make sure what we're doing um, is as good as it 
it ought to be and can be. And so really, as we look at the facilities we have, we're going we're gonna to take a breath, maximize the quality of those, and then kind of regroup for our next stage of growth, which will be, um, will be coming soon. Because healthcare is changing rapidly. Rapidly. And I think that um, you do what you do well and you intend to do more of it. And I have to say a hearty congratulations oh, on getting the Mr. K Award thank you. to you, Matthew Condon, and to the Athletic and Rehabilitation Center of our neighbor, Overland Park. Thank you very much. So thank you for coming, congratulations, thank you for being with us, and remember, it's our community. See you again soon. Thank you.